Hi guys, so I don't know if this is live, I don't know how YouTube works um, when you record directly, but I'm making a video to kind of check in and show you guys where I'm at since doing the benzo withdrawal um, and taper from a couple years ago. It's been a very long journey thinking back to my brain surgery alone in 2014. It's been a long journey. So I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. So I'm a heart transplant recipient. I got my heart transplant on November 25th of 1993. I was four years old. Um, I had odd and end surgeries up until I was 20 and then I got pregnant. Um, and my six month of pregnancy, I just, I had a really rough pregnancy as it was. I was sick every single day and I should have never had a kid because I was a heart transplant, um, but I was determined to have at least one kid. So anyways, right around my six month mark when I was pregnant, I was really sick and I started having different symptoms. Three months after I delivered my son, I found out I had cervical cancer. So two months after that, I got a hysterectomy. Um, a year after that, I got two rods and 28 screws put in my spine. I had a complete lumbar fusion um, for scoliosis that I developed from age eight and on. And I didn't wear a brace. I didn't believe in the brace. I did a lot of research on the brace and it just wasn't for me. There wasn't enough scientific research behind the brace for me to commit to it because no matter what, I was gonna get this surgery. So heart transplant, hysterectomy. I went right into menopause like two days after my hysterectomy. And then I had two rods and 28 screws put in my spine. I have a broken screw at L3 because um, the hardware defected. And then I had to get my left foot broke and about three inches of bone taken out of that. Um, about eight months, maybe a year after my spine surgery. And after the foot surgery, then I had the brain surgery. So it all went really quick. I had my son, I lost my womanhood then I had my back fused, then I had my foot operated on, then I had my brain surgery. And I had brain surgery because I had valley fever go into my brain. And it wasn't like valley fever just grew in the brain, like something, like you can't just put something there. It wasn't like it just grew in the brain. It was like, it kind of confettied, it just, exploded in my brain. So they found the largest um, piece of it in the brain and they did a punch biopsy and when they punch biopsied it I had a stroke um, and then the left side of my body had deficiencies for months and months and I did therapy and I did rehab and just had a walker and I had a cane and it was one of the more trying times of my life um, and then I had the father of my child process serve me three times in ICU took my son from me because I was too sick to be a mom and you can sit here and say oh there's no way that a judge would do that Arizona is a very shitty state for family court I'll tell you that so anyways so after the brain surgery, they put me on a long-term benzo, which was Ativan. So I was at one milligram three times a day. Um, and that was like routine. That's how it was wrote on, wrote on my bottle was take one milligram three times a day. So I think it was every six to eight hours. And then when I started telling them that it was making me tired and I couldn't function as much and I felt like it was harboring like beating down my recovery I was spending more time sleeping than I was going to therapy and I felt like that's definitely not me um so then they wrote it on the bottle you know take one milligram 
up to three times a day as needed and didn't warn me to taper, didn't warn me, you know, to slowly cut back three milligrams every day, didn't say, hey, you know, we're gonna give you a plan or how to, like, it got really sporadic on when I would take it because I didn't want to sleep all the time. So, oh, it was a challenging time. So fast forward, I think about a year after brain surgery. Um, yeah, it was about a year, almost to the day. I met somebody and we hit it off and we ended up meeting as roommates, but we ended up having a relationship. And it wasn't until he said something to me like, hey, my mom struggled coming off of Xanax. Do you know the dangers behind benzos? And I was like, no. What well, could be so dangerous about benzos? Like I had these doctors giving them to me and prescribing them to me and I could get them like, you go pick up an aspirin prescription. It was crazy. Um, it was insane. And he's like, you really need to do some research. And so I briefly got onto Google and did some research about benzos. And I was like, oh my God, this is fucking awful. Like they literally rewire your brain and they kill parts of your brain off so it doesn't function. And, and I cold turkeyed. I just stopped taking three milligrams. Um, I think by then I was down to like two and a half milligrams a day because I, like I said, I didn't want to take it. It made me tired. Um, wow. I had some seizures. Yeah, I think I made it like two or three days. And then I was just like, how could this one teeny tiny little pill make this big of a difference? And it's not the size of the pill. It's what's in the pill. Um, so I decided, okay, this is something I really, really, really want to come off. I do not want to be on this. And I got on YouTube and I started doing research and I came around or I came on to Angela's, um, video. She goes by Angie or Angie Joe. Um, she's a veteran who struggled with PTSD and, suicidal thoughts and she's just done a lot um Angela P her last name starts with a P I always pronounce it wrong so I won't say it but um if you're in the benzo world you know her and if you're starting to come in the benzo world and you don't know her I highly suggest you get very familiar with her very quickly because this woman from miles away saved my life like there were days where I remember sitting in the bathtub in my taper and um, I would text her and be like, I don't want to be here. And I don't know why I'm suicidal, but I don't want to be here. I just want to go, you know, do this or do that. I just like, I don't want to be here. And she's like, it's okay. It's a phase. It'll pass. It's your brain playing tricks on you. This is not you, you know, dig deeper, just breathe. Like that woman was literally the woman that I needed myself to be. And at the same time, she was still healing herself. So I just get familiar with her videos. And if there's somebody that helps you and you have to watch their videos 20 times in a day, well, then so be it. Because this benzodiazepine withdrawal is not for the weak. And unfortunately, that's a reason why a lot of people stay on them is because they don't think they're strong enough to come off of them. And I promise you, you are. Deep down, you really are. And you're gonna have bad days and you're gonna have days that are great days and you're gonna, you may not have bad days, but you may have bad moments in your day that you get doubtful. So I did like an 18 month taper and that's a long time. I was very fortunate to get through to a doctor to say, look, this is the Ashton Manual. I printed out the Ashton Manual. I printed out a ton of articles on benzoyl withdrawal, the ones that showed there is, it can take weeks to months to years to come off this. Um, the Ashton Manual was amazing. I printed out like six different copies. 
I gave one to my heart transplant team. I gave one to my therapist. I gave one to my primary care. I gave everybody one because there was a lot of doctors who were like, oh, I'm not very familiar with this drug that I'm prescribing. So it was just like, I felt like in some sense I opened their eyes, but um, I was fortunate to have 18 months to come off of them. And I remember the last time I took a benzo was, September 9th of 2016, my uh, a therapy dog at the time was sick and we went into this vet office and it had been an entire week that I had not had, a, it was like an eighth of a one milligram pill. And we went into this office and, you know, they just said she's not going to make it. She's she's literally bleeding out inside and there's nothing we can do. And I remember looking at this eighth of a milligram and saying, this is the day that this dies. If my therapy dog is going to die, this is the day that this habit dies. That's it. It is never to come back to life. And I took the eighth of a milligram one, because I knew I was going to have a seizure from being under so much stress from losing my dog. I knew it was going to happen. Um, and when I seize, they're not easy. They're very, very tough seizures. And I have different kinds of seizures. So took the eighth of a milligram and I held my dog and I said, okay, you can, you can go now. Um, and she died in my arms and it was just like, I had to tell myself that her leaving, she was taking this burden of this horrible withdrawal and she was going to take it with her and that was it. This, this habit was going to die. That was it. So I made it a long time. I made it a long time without a benzo. I made it years without a benzo. Um, my 14 year old sister committed suicide this year and, uh, it was July of 2020. Um, I was in a store, believe it or not, cause we're in the middle of a pandemic, but I just remember I had to go to the store for a few things and I was in the very back of the store and I had my mask on and. My grandpa called and I was like, my grandpa never calls. Like very rarely does he call and usually it's for dog food. Um, and he said, are you sitting down? And I said, no, I'm at the store, what's up? And he's like, I think you should sit down. And I was like, ah, no, I'm fine, what's going on? And he's just like, your sister committed suicide. And it just, literally felt like the store fell on me. And there was like 20 people, 15, 20 people around me. And I fell to the ground and I just started sobbing and I dropped everything in my hands cause she's 14 years old. And not one person asked, are you okay? Can I help you up? Are you okay? Not one. And it was just mind blowing that she wasn't in this world anymore. But at the same time, there was no human compassion in the world either. I just sat there on the floor in the back of the store for 10, 15 minutes, leaning into the shelf, just sobbing because she had hung herself at 14 and there was nothing I could do. And then it hit me, I had to get up, I had, I left all my stuff and as I'm walking out, I'm crying and you know, and not one person asked me, are you okay? You know, are you okay? What's wrong? And that blew me away that the world is just that ugly because I do, I try to do a lot of good for other people. Um, I run a nonprofit dog rescue and I run a pet food pantry at the same time. And um, I deliver food boxes to people as well. 
and it's like I'm constantly trying to pour good into the world so people see people like me in the store and they're like, hey, you know, so-and-so's done good to me. I need to reach out and, and repeat, repay the favor, but it didn't happen. So, um, I went out to the car and I drove home because I knew it was going to be bad and I had a seizure that night in my bed, thankfully. And, uh, for the next week, I just cried and cried and cried and asked God why. And I'm religious. That's a trigger warning. Um, so be it. But I was just like, why? Why her? Why now? Why this year of all the years? Like, we got her therapy. We got her help. Why? Why didn't any of that work? And the truth of the matter is, is just sometimes you don't know how much somebody's hurting inside. And I've been there. I have been there. And I can honestly tell you that I worry that my son's not going to be strong enough one day if he gets to that point where he gets fed up being a heart transplant or he gets tired of doing his medicines or... You know, it gets tired of blood work or tired of cardiac casts or whatever. I worry that it's going to happen. I mean, it happens to all of us transplants. We get tired of being a transplant. We just want to be normal for a day. And unfortunately, that's not an option. Your heart transplant or a kidney or a liver or a lung or a tissue or whatever, you're a transplant. So the moral of the story is, is you are going to be different compared to everybody else and everybody else is different too so um male transplants in between the ages of 11 and 14 typically start to struggle with suicide because we hold boys up to the standard that they need to be this big strong independent man with no emotions that can't cry that can express themselves and as a man and a transplant you're not like every other guy. You are fragile. You do have a suppressed immune system. You do have to take medicine. You can't just go drink with the boys or smoke with the boys or fuck up with the boys. Like, you're different. So we see suicide, suicidal thoughts, suicidal questions um, in the early stages of, of boys being a transplant. And it's something that we all go through as a transplant. Um... I don't know if older transplants go through it, but I know being a, a teenager and a transplant, even I went through it. So I worry and I pray every night in my prayers that when and if that day comes that my son is going to be strong enough, if not stronger than I am, to be able to overcome that and be strong enough to come to me and say, this is how I feel. The unfortunate part of it is that being a transplant at the age of four, I've been on and off benzos my entire life, and I never knew it till I went through my medical records. But literally, I was bounced, ba bing, ba bing, ba bing, four, 16, 6, 8, 10, 12, whatever. Literally, my medical records scare me sometimes. Um, I'm gonna do my makeup as I talk, but um. So yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I pray for him and I pray for the other teenagers that are in the medical field that are on and off benzos and their parents wonder why they're, you know, going through so much mentally if they only knew the poison that these people are putting into their kids. I think they would second guess it. Um, so... Up until my sister committed suicide, I hadn't touched a benzo in, uh, I don't know, I think that was three or four years ago. Let's see, what's the date? 2016? So yeah, almost four years. I made it almost four years. So a week after she committed suicide, um, I had a stroke. I had my second mother effing stroke, and I am only 31 years old. 
So if you think that you're young and you can't have a stroke or a heart attack, you better think again because that stuff will creep up on you. But I had a stroke. I knew something was wrong. I knew it was worse than a seizure. I just was hoping that it was going to stop. But it wasn't. So um, I just went to my dad and I said, my face is numb. And by then my face was, my face doesn't droop when I stroke. It tightens like this. So I went and I talked to my dad and I was like, something's wrong. My face can't relax and I have a hard time making words. And we went in and, uh, you know, the doctor came in and he said, I know in your chart that you put you don't want benzos. He said, but this may be the only thing that we can get to calm your body down because I have to put you in a machine. And I just knew that this was going to be hell. So they put some clot bu buster stuff in my IV and they put me in the CT and uh, I came out and then I had to go in the MRI fucking hate those they're so loud and I'm claustrophobic um, and I came out and I just remember being tired from having out of van for the first time in a long time and everything was very and uh, I woke up the next day and the doctor came in and he said you had a stroke he said, you literally have a scar on the right side of your brain from the stroke. And it is scarred. It will permanently be there for the rest of your life. And for the next year, you may have some deficiencies. You may have some problems walking or talking or trouble finding the right words. He said, but um, you definitely did have a stroke. So you can hear my dogs barking. I'm sorry. Um, so anyways... So, had a stroke. I think I was there for like five days and I was showing improvement. And to be quite honest, I can't afford to be sick and take time off because, like I said, I run my own nonprofit dog rescue. So, I had to call in a team to come take care of the dogs and my nonprofit in order to be able to be sick. So, I just, I don't have time to be sick. Period. That's it. And yes, I drink caffeine. I'm human. I'm not perfect. Um, I'm not vegan either, but I don't drink dairy. I don't like dairy. I try to stay as far away from dairy as I can. Um, so I had one milligram of Ativan a week after she committed suicide. So that was like... I don't know, mid-July, because I had this stroke. I went home, I was tired, I was still recovering, and then um, a week after I got home, I had a seizure, and I was laying in my bed, and I was just like, okay, can stop now, and I just had this horrible piercing, burning feeling in the back of my head again. Not like I had with the stroke. The stroke was different. Um, it's, it's a way different feeling. Um, so I went back into the hospital and I was like, look, I was just here like 10 days ago, but I've got this piercing, horrible ice pick in the back of my head and I had a seizure and I feel like it can't stop and my face kept twitching and my hand kept twitching and put me back in the CT thing and they took me out and they said, you're having a seizure and it's not stopping. Like this side of your brain is actively lighting up as if you're still seizing. So another milligram of Ativan to stop the seizure. Oh, I was pissed. Pissed is an understatement. Very unhappy, Marcella. Very unhappy. So here I am four years out almost, and now I've had two milligrams of Ativan in less than a month. I was so frustrated. And I was like, that's it. Cut down on the stress. 
you need to accept what has happened has happened. She is gone. She is not coming back. No matter how much you stress, cry, get mad, angry, whatever. Doesn't matter what you do. She's not coming back. Period. So stop working yourself up and trying to change something that you can't change. So I did a lot of praying. did a lot of meditation. I did a lot of me. Um... Turned off my Facebook for two weeks, got off Instagram for two weeks, completely deleted Snapchat. I did not want to keep seeing memories with her because it was just too much and this was my way of coping. So I made it like two months um, and God, I felt awful. Oh, I felt so sick. I thought I had the flu, I thought I had a sinus infection, I, I thought I had strep throat, I thought I had COVID, I mean it was on and on and on. I laid in this bed for like a month. All summer I was busy. I took care of dogs, I groomed them, I bathed them, I did their nails, I did adoption events, I did adoptions, I did, I mean all summer I was busy. Even during the pandemic, I was still at home taking care of business as a nonprofit. Um, we did drive up adoptions where I had a volunteer that would come stand in the garage and I'd get the adoption bag ready and I would set it out the door and then I'd get the harness and the collar and the tag and the leash on the dog and I would have an adopter that would submit an application and I'd pre-screen it and I would call them and they'd have to send me pictures or a video of their house and um, if they had another dog, they would have to pull up with their dog and my volunteer would do everything. Literally drive up adoptions, like drive up, here's your dog, here's your adoption bag, here's your contract, here's the records, you're good to go, we'll be in touch, you know, video wise. So we stayed busy. I mean, I had very minimal contact, but we stayed busy um, because at the beginning of the pandemic, people were dumping their animals like they were dumping off free rocks. I mean, it's ridiculous. They were like, oh, my dog can get me, my dog can give me COVID. So frustrating. So frustrating. So frustrating that so many of these animals got dumped on us. That literally was not their fault. But because the mainstream media put all these fears into people, we ended up getting the overflow of it. So anyways, so I was good all summer up until she did that and then I got hit with two milligrams of Ativan. And then for like a month, a month and a half, I was literally in bed. I could physically not get out of bed longer than like 10, 15 minutes without having heart palpitations, sweating, nauseous, headache, blurred vision, pains, trembling, rushes of adrenaline. I mean, it was ridiculous. I thought I was sick every single day. And I was just like, what the hell is going on? Like, this is not me. I am not this sick person. This was me and it clicked four years ago. And I went, oh, I'm kindled. So because I'm a heart transplant, when you do start to have palpitations and I actually had a fever, you have to take it serious. You have to ask yourself if you're in rejection. And I had to go back into the hospital. Like, like I said, it was like five or six weeks after my last Ativan from that seizure. So I had to go back into the hospital and I had to do all these tests to make sure that I wasn't in heart rejection. I've never been in heart rejection, but it's always a worry. Even 20, 28 years out now? Yeah, 28 years now. Um, so I went in and we did all these tests and they said, well, we have to do a cardiac cath. And I hate those. For those of you that don't know, a cardiac cath is where they take a sheath. It's a lovely name. It's literally a thick piece of tubing, and they make an incision in your artery, either in your neck or in your groin, which is right in between your leg and your reproductive system, whatever. Um, and they make an incision 
like this. They cut it and then they put these little prong thingies in there and they open your artery and then they shove a sheath in there. And they shove the sheath and then they apply pressure so you don't bleed out and then they release it, feed it, release it, feed it. Well, that's not comfortable because you have to be awake for that. So whether it's in my neck or whether it's in my leg, it's not comfortable. Now, they'll numb you, but you're still awake on the OR table, watching everything, feeling everything. What they don't tell you is the needle that they use to numb the area, well, they don't numb that area before that needle goes in. So you feel that needle poke you four, five, six times. So in the growing, where it's very sensitive and they're shoving this needle, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to know that. They ended up going through my neck. It was up here. Um, they didn't want to do the growing one because I've had about 22 through the growing. So I have scar tissue there. So it's a little more painful to go there than it is the neck because I haven't had as many. So the doctor's like, well, we'll slightly sedate you. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't even want to be slightly sedated. Like, I just don't want to do this. But you have to do it. It's a life or death matter. So they were like, okay, well, we'll get you in there. And I was like, no benzos, no benzos. Well, I'm allergic to Benadryl. Last time I had Benadryl in the IV, I almost went into anaphylactic shock and stopped breathing. So that's a no. Um, I'm in renal failure. My kidneys function on a good day between 32 and 36%. On an average day, it's about 28%. On a shitty day where I'm not eating and I'm only drinking soda pop and I've maybe ate candy, I don't know, and um, very, very, very shitty day, I don't drink alcohol. But on my shitty days, it's like 18%. So what you put into your body literally affects your kidney output, period, plain and simple. So I get on the table. I finally sign the paper that says I'm allowing this procedure. And I'm like, look, I'm going to do the best I can to just do it without any medicine. And I'm crying. I'm crying at the thought of being in heart rejection because it scares me that that is even an option at this point. And... I'm laying there and he's like, all right, you're gonna feel a poke. I'm crying and I feel the poke. And then my brain goes, and everything relaxes. And then Marcella in the very back of her brain goes, red flag, red flag, you should not be this calm. And, I, and I'm on the table and he's in my neck and I said, what? the F did you guys just put in my IV? What the F? And I'm crying and I'm crying at the thought that they did. They put another milligram of Ativan in my IV. So now I've had three milligrams of Ativan in less than two months. Or in two months. Whatever. Do you know how frustrating that is? Do you know the physicians don't care? They just want their patients to shut the fuck up so they can do their little procedure and pull it out, glue you, and be done. They don't care. They don't care that you're going to go home and you're going to suffer for the next 6 to 16 weeks coming off this medicine because your brain has to wake up and refire again and it's going to overfire. That is so frustrating. When you become a doctor, you take an oath to care about your patients. You take an oath to care about them, to care about the impact you make on them. And when you're just drugging them with benzos, you don't care. That oath becomes a lie. Every single doctor, nurse, practitioner, I don't care what you are, before you are allowed, this is how it should be, before you're allowed to prescribe a benzo, you should have to take a benzo for a minimum of four weeks, a maximum of six weeks, and then we, the patients, should be able to rip it out from under you and see how you function as a physician. Because I promise you, you will not be the same. I can promise you it'll change your whole perspective how you treat your patients what you put them on and what you take them off of and how quickly you do it. 
I don't think physicians should be able to prescribe benzos or narcotics or anything along those lines until they take it themselves for a short period of time and then how they are going to take their patients off of it if they're going to taper them or rip them off of it or maybe use other different things to take them off of it they should have to go through the exact same steps before they're allowed to do it period said my piece on that one so I had no heart rejection praise Jesus I had some weird underlying um, viral infection so we did antibiotics and then um, I was sent home and I remember back up a second I came out of cath lab at like 4 30 p.m. and I literally slept until the next day at like 3 30 p.m. literally almost 24 hours I remember waking up super groggy that night to do my heart meds and the nurse had put a pain pill in my cup and I was like I'm not taking this and she's like, well, it's your, and I said, I'm so tired. Like, if I were to take a narcotic on top of the benzo that they put in my IV, like, I'm going to stop breathing. Central nervous system, CNS, look it up. So, I rejected it. Like, no thanks. I was so tired. Like, I had to pee and I could barely get up. That's what benzos do to you. They literally turn you into a blob when they're put in your IV at a high dose, like one milligram. So I came home and I started telling myself, okay, I'm gonna be better. Like I came home, I made it through it, I'll be fine. No. I laid in that bed with my dogs. For, um, today makes four weeks, four weeks since my last Kindle of Ativan, and I started to get very, very depressed, very depressed. It's bad. Like, I have to take care of myself, I have to take care of my dogs. I have to stay focused on my nonprofit, and it is so hard to stay focused when, and it's not some days, it's some moments in your day. Like, some normal people will be like, oh, Tuesday was a good day. I woke up, I did this, I did that, da 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 da, -da. It was a good day. Literally, when you're in benzo land, whether you're on it, off it, kindling, tapered, withdrawing cold turkey whatever you know what I'm talking about like you can wake up and between 8 15 and 9 43 you're great and then your brain will go and you're angry and then it could be a few minutes it could be a few hours and then your brain will go and you're sad and then it could be a few minutes or a few hours and then you're fine like benzo land is no mother effing joke it is literally like confetti like, oh, I'm picking up pink. It's pink right now. Oh, I'm picking up blue. It's blue right now. It is the hardest thing anybody can ever go through on their own. Just even with a small support system or a large support system, it is a hard thing to do. It is not taken seriously by physicians. And I think that's the most frustrating thing is maybe one in every 15 doctors take it seriously. And it's usually the doctors that nobody else will listen to. So that's the frustrating part as well. So I'm kindled and that's really frustrating. But in the last two days, I finally either A, I've hit a window or B, I'm finally coming out of it. And it's just mind blowing. So I've wrote down my symptoms, um, 
and I just want to tell you guys what my symptoms have been since the first day that I was given Ativan coming off, going on, coming off, going on because I literally thought I was going crazy with everything going on with my body and I'm not. It's literally coming off of benzos again and my brain waking up and feeling all these different things again. It's just becoming who you are again, but your brain's on overload because it's not used to it or because that drug shut it off and it went to sleep for so long. So today and the last three days, my lips have been numb. They're numb to the touch. They're numb when I eat. They're numb with hot and cold. They're numb when I talk. Um, and that's just part of withdrawal. There's going to be things on you that go numb and you're going to think, oh my God, I have multiple sclerosis. Oh my God, I have neuropathy. Oh my God, I have this. I have. It'll pass. I promise it'll pass. It may take a while, may not take a while, but it'll pass. You've got to hang in there. Like, that's the best thing I can tell you is do not s sit down, write out your options. Do not make giving up or giving in an option. Those are not options. Giving up and giving in to taking a benzo should not be an option on your list. Period. Find other options. My symptoms were I was dizzy. I had urgent need to pee, like sporadically. Some days I was fine. Other days I thought my bladder was going to fall out. I had constipation. I had diarrhea. And it was sporadically. This wasn't like these days and then, no. This was like all these different symptoms at once. Um, my tongue trembled and it felt like it was swelling. And that lasted, I think, three or four days where I literally, my tongue felt like it was seizing. And I thought, well, maybe it's my piercing. I've had my piercing for almost five years. Yeah, right. Um, my legs were trembling. I had horrible leg pain. I had muscle cramps. I had Charlie horses. Um, it felt like somebody was drilling into the top of my thigh bone. It felt like somebody whacked my knee out of place. I had, I would wake up and my hands would be numb. Scary. First, it started with my legs and it started with my left leg, which my left leg naturally has a deficiency ever since brain surgery because when they did the punch biopsy and I stroked, I stroked on the right side. So I have deficiencies on the left side of my brain because that's how, or the left side of my body because that's how your brain works. Your right is for your left and your left is for your right. So they punched biopsy on the right and I lost a lot of feeling on my left. So when my left leg started being numb when I woke up, I didn't think too much of it because I already have a reason why. Um, but then it moved into my right leg and then it was both legs. And then I remember one morning I woke up and both my hands were numb and it was like laying there and doing this and like trying to get my hands to wake up and it would take five to 15 minutes to get my hands feeling moving again and they were numb they were swollen they were red they would hurt it sucked so then I was like my hands are numb my legs are numb my arms are numb that passed, I think it's been day five or six now that I wake up and my hands are there and I can feel them. Um, I laid wrong last night. I was reading a story to one of my dogs because I read on the internet and uh, I laid on my shoulder wrong and it pinched a nerve and my whole arm went numb. And I was like, nope, pulled my shoulder back, kind of rubbed it for a couple minutes and my hand came right back. So you're going to have little hiccups here and there, but you really just have to stick stick it out and work through it. I had bad, frightening thoughts. I mean, terrifying. From my mom driving and falling off a bridge, to my dad having a heart attack, to my dog getting wrapped in a cord in my room and me not noticing. I mean... I had these horrible flashes if I went and drove anywhere that this would happen. 
it was bad and it sucked and um, they can get very scary and that's not me that's not who I am so it was really digging down to myself and remembering who I am and what my core values are and what I believe and I had to write them down and remind myself this is not you this is your body fighting back against you not having that drug in your system just stick through it I promise you just stick through it so I had heart palpitations really bad whether I was standing up laying down sitting taking a shower um, I would have panic attacks in the shower because I was in the shower and I couldn't see what was going on in the house I would start panicking that something was wrong so short-lived showers or baths sometimes there was days where I didn't take one because I was so afraid that if I took a shower or a bath, something else was gonna happen outside. Um, numbness in the left side of my face, and that's part of my brain surgery, part of withdrawal, because that nerve starts to refire again, so it overfires, so my eye will do this, my eyebrow will do this, my lip will do this, the list goes on and on. I ended up with ringing in the ears again. I ended up with, when I turned my head to the right, my ear would go. Um, I had zaps all over my brain. There were mornings where I woke up and I was totally fine. And then at nine o'clock, it would feel like someone's just doing all over the brain. Um, I had moments where I'd be talking to somebody and my brain would go. And reset and I'm like okay so anyways that's literally what it felt like um, I had a runny nose I had watery eyes I had this eye got really red and inflamed then my eye this eye followed both my eyes were red and inflamed I thought I had pink eye it was a pink eye then my right breast started to swell I thought I had a lump it wasn't a lump that went down in two days Oh, I had depersonalization. I had derealization. I felt like I wasn't real. I felt like the world wasn't real. I felt like the pandemic wasn't real. I felt like it was real. It freaking sucked. Just sucked. I had shakes. I had trembles. I had trouble speaking. I would say a word and I would think that it sounded wrong. So I would say it another 20 times to make sure that I'm saying it right. I was like mid conversation with my mom on the phone and I was just like, what did I say? I was like, oh yeah, when it goes numb. And she's like, when it goes numb? And I'm like, yeah, when it goes numb. And then I was like, all right, I gotta go. And I'd hang up the phone with her and I'd be like, numb, 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 numb. When my leg goes numb, when my arm goes numb, when my hand goes numb, like over repeating that word because I was like, you know this word, you've said this word, you can write, read, and spell this word. Why are you having problems with it? Well, I did have a stroke, but I was also kindled three times. So, recipe for disaster. Um, I had horrible shakes. There would be moments where I'm totally just standing there fine, making dinner, whatever, and then my arm would start going like this. Or, you know, my muscle in my arm would be freaking out. Like... It sucked because when your body does that stuff and you can see it or you can feel it, you start to panic. You start to have an anxiety attack. You start to think, what's wrong? What's happening next? Freaking sucks. Um, I had rushes of adrenaline and then I started having seizures. I started having absent seizures where I wasn't here for a minute. I started having tonic-clonic seizures. I started having you know, where I would zone out and just, I would be mid conversation and my dad would say the last word and then I'd be like, and in my head, I know what I'm getting ready to say. I know what I want to say to him, but it would take my brain a few minutes to start to talk again, to start to fire to my mouth to say what I want to say. Um, the depression was really hard. The anxiety was really hard. The depersonalization, derealization was really hard. If I didn't have the dogs that I have, I could tell you 110%, it would have been a lot worse. A lot worse. Um, so, yeah. 
like it was just it was it was crazy I'll probably have to make a second video um, to this I have about 10 minutes left before my timer goes off because I'm supposed to be doing my makeup but um I had air hunger where I thought I wasn't getting enough air in it felt like I was because I just felt like I wasn't getting enough air and my oxygen saturations were great. They were 98, 99, sometimes 100. I had loss of sleep. I had oversleep. I would sleep for four hours and feel refreshed. I would sleep for 16 hours and feel refreshed. It's crazy. I had low blood pressure. There it is. I had low blood pressure. Um, I think it was like 97 over 64. So my blood pressure would fluctuate. I couldn't do basic things. Like it was hard for me to shower. It was hard for me to brush my teeth. It was hard for me to scrub my back or scrub my arms or wash my legs. Like it's hard for me to shave. I had full blown migraines where I would have to lay down flat, put, you know, a pack of peas over my head and my eyes because my migraine would hurt so bad. But I had insomnia. I couldn't read some days where the words would be all jumbled and I just, I couldn't focus to read. Um, I literally lived in my bed with my dogs. So, and I take care of my dad. He's terminally ill. So I have to take care of myself to take care of my dad and my dogs and people in my life. I just have to. I can't imagine what it's like to be homeless or be an addict on the street to be ripped on and off these drugs and not have something as simple as a bed to go to. Like, that's really, really gotta be hard. Um, or to be a teenager and have to go to high school every day with these symptoms. This shit's serious. And it, it and it's taken so lightly. We have got to demand better for the people that are upcoming in the generation that are going to be prescribed it. It needs to stop. These drugs need to stop. And the people that are coming off of it or going to come off of it or tapered or whatever... They need to be focused on and they need to be helped and real help. So many treatment centers are like, oh yeah, we do benzo withdrawal and, you know, we'll get you off benzos in two weeks, but we're going to throw you on all these SSRIs and we're going to give you these tranquilizers. That's like saying instead of pouring gas on the fire, let me pour, like, doesn't make any sense. Instead of pouring gas on your fire, let me pour perfume on it, like, or alcohol like you're literally lighting the brain more on fire when you do that so I know some people that have come off benzos and they're still on SSRIs and that helps them long term and that's great but don't make crutches with other parts to make up for the benzo like you you've got to come off the benzos my mom is on and off of benzos right now as we speak. She calls me multiple times a day in a panic attack. And she'll take a sliver or a half of an Ativan and she'll be fine for the next 12 hours, sometimes a day. And I still cannot get through to her that it's the benzos. That's frustrating. But it's true. It's painful to hear your parent cry on the other line that they don't know what's wrong with them and they feel sick and you know exactly what's wrong with them and you can't help them because they won't listen so that's painful um I had double vision I had muscle cramps I felt like my muscles were stiff and riggedy my body temperature fluctuated from low-grade fevers of 100.4 to 96.8 I had hot flashes, I had cold sweats, I had agitation where I was angry for no reason at anything and everything, whatever. I was crying. Literally, I would cry for no reason. I would just be in bed watching TV and I'd just be like, <laughs> and 
I would just start bawling and I didn't know why. Your brain is this beautiful, beautiful organ and it has so many nerves and just tissue and muscles and your brain is this beautiful thing. And when it gets surgery, it makes an impact on that beautiful thing. But when you take a benzo, it literally goes into your brain. Just the best way I could describe it is if, it, if your brain was a bouquet of flowers, that benzo goes in and it literally collapses certain flowers. And then you're left with just these four roses that you can kind of function like a zombie. And when you come off of benzos and you detox from them, these little flowers start to open back up in the bouquet. And sometimes they can open up way.